So the challenge is this. Over the next week, what I'd like you to do is go to bed about an hour to two hours earlier than usual. That's going to take some commitment. You're going to have to probably move some things around. Manage your time much better. And when that moment comes to go to bed, you're going to actually have to follow through. I would suggest eating earlier than usual. I would suggest never eating probably after 7 p.m. If you get past 7 p.m., maybe have a small snack and then leave it at that. Plenty of studies show that once we start, the later we eat, 11, 12 o'clock, it starts screwing around with our memory. It doesn't just screw around with our bodies, it screws around with our memories. If you're already having challenges remembering, recalling dreams, then you have to look at your diet, you have to look at your lifestyle. We don't want our bodies busy digesting food in the middle of the night. We want our bodies doing cell repair. We want our brains to be at their peak so we can actually have moments of access to working memory so we remember to do stuff. We remember to use tools so we can deepen these experiences. So I would suggest going to bed a couple of hours earlier than usual, an hour to two hours. For me, that would look like around 10 p.m. I would then set my alarm six hour, for six hours, to wake me up in six hours. So I get four complete 90-minute sleep cycles. The first four and a half hours of sleep is delta, deep delta, non, uh, non-REM sleep. So uh, delta waves, which are geared towards rejuvenating the body and the mind. Um, so growth hormone at 1.05 hertz, as an example, is one of the frequencies we'll experience in deep sleep. And this is all about rejuvenation, antioxidant, uh, um, sort of repairing cells, etc. So that first four and a half hours of sleep is vitally important. I would then tack an extra hour and a half on top, so that makes four sleep cycles in total. That way you've started getting into REM sleep. So at the beginning of the night, it's dominated by delta waves. The longer you start to sleep after four and a half to six hours, so seven and a half hours, uh, nine hours, the long, the more REM cycles you get and the less delta waves you get. So more theta waves. And why is that important? Because that's dream-induced sleep. So the first half of the night, we don't have a lot of dreams that we actually remember. We still can dream, but most of it we won't remember. Whereas the second half of the night, this is when most of us start to recall experiences. If you're not at the moment getting at least six, six hours of sleep as a norm, you need to look at that. Seven and a half to nine hours is the appropriate amount of sleep for people who do exploration work of this nature. So you're waking up after six hours. You're already caught short an hour and a half to three hours based on what I just said. But you're then going to dedicate a three, yourself to a three-hour practice. Okay? The first 30 minutes of that practice. So for me, I'll go through exactly what it looks like. So over here... Take a look at these chairs. They're reclined in just a way. When you get in them, you're going you're gonna to be bowled over by their comfort. So they're comfortable, but yet they're not your typical sleeping position. You could go onto eBay and find something very similar that's collapsible. It's called a zero-gravity lounge chair. They cost about 50 pounds. You can fold them up and put it under your bed or put it in a closet or behind a wardrobe. Unfold it, maybe get yourself get a little bit extra comfort. Uh, go on eBay and buy yourself some memory foam, like a memory foam topper, two inches. That's perfect. Two inches, smaller, just smaller than single size. It'll be perfect for one of those zero gravity lounge chairs. And you can just fold the whole thing up and put it away when it's not in use. So when I wake up, there's a couple things that I do. I go to the toilet because I don't want to be three hours into meditation effectively and then halfway through my bladder's like, hello, need to have a pee, because then you have to abort your mission, okay? So go into the toilet before you start. You've probably not drank anything because you've been asleep for six hours, so small bit of water, maybe half a glass of water is good. If you're gonna eat anything, maybe something very light like an apple, half an apple maybe, not much more than that. 
just, you know, the, the half a glass of water should be enough to where you don't have a completely empty stomach and you should be fine. Now you're going to get on with your, your practice. So you're going to choose a spot like um, something like this or the sofa where, where maybe you can take a, some of the cushions and arrange it into a nice little uh, reclined position. But what you want is your, your head, your neck, and your upper back to be about a, at a 30 degree angle off the head of the bed, off, off the, uh, the bed, the mattress itself. Okay? So that maybe three or four pillows to where you're now elevated because it does a couple things. When we're standing or sitting in this vertical setup, basically our heart is a pump, it's pumping blood up to the brain, gravity brings it back down again. So you get this perfect circulation of, of blood. When we're lying down horizontally with one or two pillows, the heart is still pumping blood to the brain, but gravity is no longer bringing it down. So you get what's called intracranial pressure. It can screw around with short-term memory um, and therefore working memory. Um, and it also um, can give you that brain fog. It can, call, it can be literally the cause of migraine headaches, um, ADHD, lots of things. The NASA studies that have been done have shown some great research. So I would uh, type in things like NASA, sleep studies, uh, elevated beds, think hospital beds, you know, when they're elevated. Perfect position for this stuff. But there's two different positions that you can utilize. That, that type of position, the elevated position on your back, almost always guaranteed to lead to an OBE, an out-of-body experiences, versus a lucid dream, almost always. When you lie on your side, your left or your right, for some reason, and this has been documented for well over thousands of years by you know, um, people in the East who've practiced dream yogas, when you, a male in particular lies on his right-hand side, we have what's called the triple warmer. So we have these three central uh, channels. When we lie on the right-hand side, it's putting pressure on the masculine channel, which opens more of the feminine channel and vice versa. So a man is instructed to lie on his right side for dream practice. A woman is instructed to lie on her left because then that puts pressure on the feminine channel, which then opens more of the masculine channel and it creates more balance. So from my own personal experiences, I find that is pretty much the case that I have more lucid dreams when I'm lying on my right hand side than I do on my back. And when I'm on my back, I have more out of body experiences than I do lucid dreams. So if that interests you, then practice it, keep a journal, log the experiences and the data, and you'll get your own conclusions soon enough. You won't need to take anybody else's word for it. You'll have direct experience to, to actually show you reality. Just clarify, so laying on your right, you get lucid dreams, and laying on your back, you get astral, yeah? Yes. Or being prone, face down on the, on, on the bed. Yeah. Or a prone position where you're face down. So prone or back is astral. Usually astral. And then on the sides can lead to more. This is not every time, but it is more often than not that on the sides you'll get lucid dream activity more than you'll get out-of-body experiences. And being prone, either lying on your tummy or lying on your back, will lead in most cases to out-of-body experiences versus lucid dreams. <laughs> Say that again? I said that's true. I've experienced that. A lot of people have. And like I said, it's been documented you know, by Tibetan practitioners for thousands of years. Except when I've tried, when I'm down on that and I get an itch and I just can't get past not itching it. And I'm then let me tell you the simplest thing to do is to itch. Okay. Okay? <laughs> because otherwise it remains a distraction until you actually do itch. Yeah. I, if I'm 30 minutes in and I have an itch, I'll itch. Okay. Because the moment I itch, I put my arm back down, I haven't broken my state enough okay. you know, to come out of a, a deep trance state or a mildly trance state. So it's best you itch. But typically when we're in, we enter a medium to deep trance state, you're not going to feel anything like that anyhow. Okay. Okay? Same goes with things like breathing and swallowing. Let's say for tomorrow morning when you're in these chairs... You're maybe about an hour and a half, maybe two hours into your practice without moving your, your physical body because this is the next, well, I'll get to the next step. Uh, we haven't got to the first step yet. But let's say you get to that stage to where you want to swallow and you're like, oh, I, if I swallow, I'm going to break my state. Please swallow, okay? Please don't get caught up with that stuff. I read it so often online. What do I do? What do I do? I want to swallow, but I'll break my state. Just swallow, 
<laughs> Seriously. You're not moving much musculature except for what's right through here. And it is so easy to get the head relaxed again. The difficult parts are these twitchy arms and twitchy legs. They're the bits that are challenging. They're the bits where we feel the more intensity of wanting to move during insomnia. We'll suddenly feel like in the legs or you know, in the arms or maybe here in the body, but rarely in the head, rarely in the neck. So please, just swallow. It won't be a problem. If you get to a point where you feel suddenly like you've stopped breathing, you probably have. But only because you've entered the out-of-body state where you have no lungs in your energy body or astral body. That's called the last breath. Sometimes it, it freaks people out. But if I preload you now with the idea that it could happen, then you won't get so freaked out by it. You can always take a deep breath. And if you realize you were in your energy body, then you know what? If you keep your body perfectly still, you can re-enter that state again almost effortlessly. The key is always keeping yourself still. Just yesterday, I remained still for three hours. Each time I went out of body and returned, I kept physically still and I waited usually for things to happen again or I used breath work again. Didn't worry about expanding my chest or my belly. That's not going to break my state. It's going to deepen it because it's building energy. I had 12 conscious exits from the body yesterday because for three hours I kept myself perfectly still. What most people will do is, let's say they're there for maybe an hour to 90 minutes. Maybe they'll get like intense vibrations. They're about to have an out-of-body experience. It goes wah, 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 wah. Nothing happens. And then they move. And if they would have waited another five or 10 minutes, did a little bit more visualization, a little bit more breath work, it would have come back again. And then when they returned, it would have come back again if they remained still. And if they remained still after returning again, they could have gone out again and again and again until they got bored. That's how it happens. In most cases, people don't have the patience to do three hours of lying completely still. You might think, well, what happens if I fall unconscious? Perfect, absolutely perfect. Because what we need to happen here is for sometimes for you to get out of your own way. You're like lying there, not quite a Jedi master yet, patience wise. And you're like, I've been lying here for 10 minutes, nothing's happened. 10 minutes is not enough in most cases. Half an hour is not enough in most cases. For a lot of people who are really practicing this from a standing start, you need an hour, two hours, three hours to get to a very deep place. And then that may not be enough. It may be a week before it happens. But if you're practicing every single day with this mindset of patience, then there is no rush. It'll happen when you're at your most patient. When you talked about time, how do you know or how long have you been lying still? I always set an alarm for three hours. And in the beginning, I always used an audio track, which takes me into um, a half an hour uh, before I get a signal and then an hour between there's another signal and a an hour and a half between there's another signal and then no more signals after the first 90 minutes. So I have three signals, very light signals, like maybe the smallest chime of a bell on an audio track. Uh, and, and then after that 90 minutes is up, it's all me and reality only. And then my mobile phone alarm can wake me up after three hours. Okay. You had a question? Um, I did regards to sleep myself, but whenever I literally hit the bed and I fall asleep. Okay, good. Um, I don't have breath, I don't really dream. I'm, I mean, I'm obviously busy, busy. I literally hit the sack, I fall asleep, I wake up. Well, you I don't have six hours sleep normally, though. That's perfectly fine. It sounds like you're getting delta sleep, which is what you need. Yeah, I get delta sleep, I don't get REM sleep. But I because you don't sleep. stay asleep long enough. No, but obviously I, I, I can't say But obviously I, I'm a very ADHD person. I find very okay, important. stop right there. This is really important what I say next for everybody. Regardless of what stuff you have going on, it's no excuse. And I mean that, it's no excuse. You either make changes to accommodate the practice or you stay where you're at. It's that simple. You do not get to use anything here as an excuse period. It may seem harsh, but it's reality because I see it too often. Okay. Even our, our childhood stuff, we all had childhood traumas. 
It's everybody's story. It's not just yours. It gets to a point when we get to a certain age in life where we know for a fact that we're hiding behind our stuff. And it's then up to you to not just intellectualize that stuff, but actually do something about it. There are things you can do with regards to ADHD and whatever else that can help lead you into the deeper territory you want to go, I promise you. And by the time we finish at 1 p.m. tomorrow, I will have loaded you down with plenty of ideas, okay? Just promise me that, you know, whatever came before this day, you will be willing to work with new ideas so you can achieve your goals. Oh, that's, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, just, it's no different from anything else I've learned in life. There's been many nights where I'm lying asleep at night with huge questions on my mind that I feel I may never get answers to. But the moment, you know, I start looking again, the moment I start setting my intention and start asking for assistance, for help, not just non-physically, not just physically, a mixture, things start to move, things start to happen. I start to get help, I start to get answers, okay? So I promise you, I'll give you some, some good ideas, and it's good that you've at least brought, brought it to light, because that's important. But I promise you, no matter what has taken place in your past, with a loving intention, you can get past it and achieve these goals, okay? Insomnia, I don't care what it is. Um, Mike, can you just uh, retrace to the first thing you said? You said the alarm for, you said the alarm for six hours. Six hours of sleep. All right. And okay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring out a couple of supplements um, for you to peruse. Not to take, because I'm not giving out supplements. But if you want to just write that down and then pass it along. So that's 5-HTP. 5-HTP is a precursor to serotonin. Almost all of our serotonin is produced right here in the gut. All right? Um, serotonin as a supplement, if you were to take like serotonin literally as a supplement, it does not cross the, the blood-brain barrier. For lucid dreaming and for out-of-body exploration and for uh, re the perfect type of sleep for this practice, we want it to cross the blood-brain barrier. 5-HTP is a precursor to serotonin. It will cross the blood-brain barrier and then it will convert to serotonin. Why is that important? Because serotonin is a, a REM blocker, REM sleep blocker. Now you might be thinking, oh shit, but we want to have REM sleep. So the first 90 minutes, so you fall asleep, for you, boom, lights out almost instantly, good? That's not a problem, that's, that's what you really want, okay? You want to fall asleep really quickly at night when you get into bed. You can use things like soothing music to help you do that. Aromas can help you do that. I've got one of these oil, um, electric oil burners where it'll run for an hour, two hours, whatever I program it to do, and then it'll switch off. So I can use things like lavender and other kind of soothing smells. Um, I can work out earlier in the day, uh, which can bring rest later at night. All kinds of good ideas not eating closer to bed because then I'm digesting and that can keep you awake. So there's many ideas that we'll discuss that can help you get lights out quicker, all right? But, so what serotonin, what 5-HTP can do for a lucid dreamer is this. It'll block all REM sleep in the first half of the night. So typically we get a perfect balance of non-REM and REM sleep. So that basically looks like, let's say, most sleep cycles are 90 minutes in length, 90 minutes to 120 minutes. The average person is more like about 90 minutes. You fall asleep, you go through like alpha, theta, delta, and for about 80 minutes to 85 minutes, you're in delta. Maybe 10, 15 minutes into delta sleep, if somebody was to come in and they're like, wake up, wake up, and they call your name, it'll take forever to wake you up. And when you do, you'll have what's called sleep inertia. You'll be oh, a little groggy and you won't want to get up. Okay, we've all probably experienced that. So after that first 90 minute cycle, you've had about 80, 80 to 85 minutes of delta, deep sleep, and about five to 10 minutes of REM sleep. The next 90 minute cycle, it resets itself. You have about, at that point, it, go, it starts to go um, slightly shorter delta. So instead of 80 to 85 minutes out of the 90, it's maybe about 75 to 80 minutes is delta, and now you've got about 10 to 15 minutes of REM. Does that make sense? 
when you get, let's say you're sleeping nine hours, when you get to that four and a half hour mark, it almost switches round. Whereas where your REM cycles are elongated and your delta cycles are shortened. To the point, if you sleep nine hours, you're getting about almost all of that 90 minutes is pretty much REM. About 80 minutes of it or more is pure REM. So dream induced sleep. So 5-HTP causes what's called REM rebound. This is well documented. If you were to pop one of these right before bed, it kills all REM sleep entirely. And after about that four and a half hour mark, there's pretty much no delta waves. It's just pure REM. So you're still getting a perfectly balanced night's sleep. You're getting all the delta you need and all the REM that we need, but it's now balanced, one on the first half of the night and one on the second half of the night. The, the 5-HTP blocks REM sleep. Yes, because the serotonin is now being converted into melatonin after you know, it it's, uh, reaches its peak, pl peak plasma level. So you then get this complete opposite effect. Okay? But then, sorry, just a question. Um, we've used 5-HTP a lot in the past, and, and it's basically believed that if you use it more than three months, really, it's can cause depression. First and foremost, I'm not finished, and I'm not going to recommend that you use it every day. Okay? It's like with most things, you would maybe want to use something for a week or two weeks. Uh, it's all about respect. And then you take a, a period off from it. Okay? In most cases, with any type of supplements, maybe you're using them about once every three to four nights. Because in a lot of cases, most people can't dedicate themselves to a seven-day we practice. It's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of hard work. And you get to a point where you basically want to be doing this stuff without any supplements, without any crutches, just you and reality. All right. So the 5-HTP is not something I'm recommending you do every single night for months on end. It's just not what I would recommend. Okay. It's when you want to do some really advanced work really advanced work okay exactly so like yesterday when i had 12 exits from the body that was advanced stuff i visited over 20 friends in various states that they were experiencing between unconscious sleep states where i met them where they were like a zombie standing on the astral planes and i sort of just made a connection with them you know mentally uh, made the suggestion, if it's okay with them, uh, you know, this higher part of them, if I may have permission to enter the dream state. And for some of them, I entered the dream states, met them while they're doing very unconscious stuff in the dream, tried to wake them up. A couple of them there, I successfully woke up within the dream. And then when they woke up in physical reality, they were asleep by that time again. And they, because when people become lucid in a dream for the first time ever, it's difficult to stay lucid long enough. You usually fall unconscious again before you wake up. And people usually don't remember much, except for maybe there were two people that reported me in their dreams last, you know, yesterday, but they have no conscious memory of me waking them up. So what I'm getting at here next is another important aspect to this stuff. Each one of us is living a double life. We just don't know it. Literally every single night you're having out-of-body experiences. Every single night, all night long, you're either out of body or you're in dream sleep. One of those two things is happening. In a lot of cases, it's like your energy body is like a helium balloon. It's just coming out of phase with the physical body and it's just floating above the bed. And you're in dream, a dream state. And you're literally in this, these you know, blockbuster Hollywood film type dreams and you're in the out of body state already. You're not even in your body. You're literally, your energy body is phased out or because you have an essence that literally not just survives death but precedes birth, your astral body holds all the memories of all the places that you lived before you came here. On autopilot, every single night, it'll make a beeline for places that are home on other levels. Every night without fail. You're just not remembering it. There's literally a memory issue between these different levels of our being because we're not trained from birth as children to do this stuff. At best, the, the guidance we get is, oh, it was just a dream, go back to sleep. 
We literally have to start doing better than that as adults with children. Because I guarantee you, from my perspective as a child, and probably you've experienced somewhat the same, when I started having lucid dreams and out-of-body experiences at age six, I wasn't just sleeping at night. I was going off to other realities. I was being taught stuff. I was learning stuff that was useful in my everyday life. We're doing more than sleep. There's a lot going on. And you're already doing it. If any of you who are friends with me on Facebook, you've probably seen just in the last couple of weeks some of the stuff that I've shared, you know, with regards to my wife, Sky. You know, we're regularly practicing this stuff. And the idea of us practicing together is because we want to be able to consciously exit the body near enough the same time so we can project to another level of reality together. Because on another dimension of reality, you're in another time zone. Time can act differently in these environments because each reality has its own rule set with regards to time. You can have realities where there's just diffused light in the sky and it never sets because it's not really a sun. It's just the idea of light. They're aware that their reality is constructed, but they're living there nonetheless because they're, they've got lessons and they're learning in those environments. Then we have these really denser environments where we have all these sort of physical laws, but yet these physical laws and this physical reality is taking place within the one true reality of consciousness, which is non-physical by nature. So as physical as your reality is, it's still non-physical on a deeper level. This is mental stuff taking place within the mind and there are rule sets that say, this is what physical feels like. No different from the people that stand there on the edge of this 30 meter pit and won't walk across that plank. It's that real. But you're not just wearing an eye mask. You're not just wearing a headset. Your soul has literally been melded, you know, in a sense, energetically melded to this virtual reality. And it becomes a very real physical experience to this part of you. But you're having these experiences every night. Just going back to the, this particular plane that we're in at the moment, this experience we're in at the moment. When they say people get tied into this cycle of samsara on this plane, it literally means they get too far, does it, does it literally mean they get too far attached to this reality and they then lose set track of all the other realities they should be learning in? They literally become addicted. It's no different from any other addiction. Robert Monroe, who's a, um, a well-known out-of-body explorer, he's deceased now, but uh, wrote three books on the subject. He would call them physical reality addicts. But in most cases, their lucidity between lives is very low. And until you can get to the point of increasing your lucidity in the waking state, it, really, it usually doesn't translate into the other states either. So the more lucid you become here, the more lucid you are there in the afterlife state. This is why we have things like the Tibetan Book of the, Be the Dead to actually guide us into even having something like a conscious death. What's not real is us maintaining these, this old paradigm that was set in place by a control system, mm. by a system that does not want you to know you have a multidimensional heritage. Mm. It is literally about control. Yeah. So let's get back to the, the uh, practice in a nutshell because it's become more of a nutshell. <laughs> so when you've gotten up, you've six hours of sleep, Wake up, go to the toilet, grab some water, maybe something like half an apple. Really don't want anything more than that in your body. You then lie down in the appropriate position. Do I want to do more of a dream practice tonight? So left side for uh, women, right side for men. Do I want to have an out-of-body experience? In most cases, it's lying on your back or the prone position on your tummy. You're then going to set like your alarm if you need to get up to go to work, things like that, or be productive for about three hours. So this is looking, at, looking like gone to bed at 10, woken up at four, so between four and seven a.m. you're totally dedicated to this practice. For the first 30 minutes, I want you to do breath work. It may sound like a lot. <laughs> 30 minutes is a lot, especially if you're not used to doing breath work. 
So everybody sit up, feet on the floor, and I want you to just go through a very simple breathing practice with me. So I want you to imagine you're lying down in one of these, uh, let's say you're going to practice out of body stuff. So you're in a reclined uh, position. Your body is nice and relaxed. No pressure on any other, on most points of your body. I want you to think before you start of Laughing Buddha. What's the metaphor of Laughing Buddha? So what's, what's Laughing Buddha look like physically? Big belly. Up. Round belly. That's a metaphor for what? This is where I hold my chi. This is where I hold my energy. Yeah, so when you hear that sea of chi, that literally that profound belly is the Buddha's metaphor for where I hold my energy. This is in things like uh, Chinese uh, Qigong, this is the lower Dantian. It's a storage center that can then be sort of drawn upon for transforming in different ways. So what I want you to do, you're lying there, and for 30 minutes, I want you to breathe through the nose. We breathe through the nose. There's some great breathing practices out there, even like the Wim Hof Method. They teach where breathing through the mouth as well as through the nose. But for the out-of-body stuff, we want to do specifically through the nose, and I'll tell you why. Because when you breathe through the nose, there's a chemical process that takes place. It's nitric oxide. It literally opens, forces open the blood vessels around the entire body. The more of those you get open, the more CO2 you can expel from the body. When we expel CO2, literally the nervous system makes this shift. The body's electrical system makes a shift in DC current from one direction to another. This is literally when we go from this sensory input mode to an intention-based output mode where it's introspection. It's focusing inwards. So by doing the breath through the nose, we're opening up a lot of blood vessels where oxygen is getting around and CO2 is, is being, being displaced and your body is making that electrical switch and DC current from one direction to the next. And any research that's been done with EEG and uh, um, breath work and psychic studies have shown this response that the body goes through. So breathing through the nose causes that. When you breathe exclusively through the mouth, that, um, okay? So nasal breathing is very important. As long as you're breathing in through the nose, breathe out through the mouth is fine. It's up to you, whether it's pure nasal breathing or just through the nose and then out through the mouth. I'll leave that bit up to you, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to keep your breath cycle in the beginning, something nice and balanced. So something like two breaths in, sorry, two seconds in, one second out. Two seconds in, one second out. There's so many different breathing practices. Like Wim Hof, you're looking at almost two breath cycles per second. You know, when they're, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a lot, but that's quite advanced. Even though, you know, you're starting people off at that level, it is very similar in nature to hyperventilation, but the difference is this. Hyperventilation is induced by stress and anxiety. This type of breathing, this faster breathing style, is induced consciously. There's a huge difference between what's going to happen next. All right? It's a controlled breathing and therefore it's more balanced. But what I would like you to start with is something more like uh, two seconds on the in-breath, one second on the out-breath, or two seconds in, two seconds out. Nice and balanced, okay? If you, want, if you already feel you're advanced with a breath work practice, please, whatever you've, you've used in the past, use to your advantage now. But I want it to be comfortable enough to where you can do it for about 30 minutes. So you got three hours, first 30 minutes is gonna be dedicated to doing this breath work. You might think that's a lot of breath work. It is a lot of breath work, but it's really going to take you someplace. A breathing practice and keeping the body still is enough to enter an, al enter an altered state. It's enough. A lot of times when people want to do these explorations, they're, they learn so much and they have so much information and trying to sort of remember it, the ordering and doing everything it can get confusing. 
breath work and keeping the body still with eyes closed or open because you can get deep and then suddenly that sensory input, like I said, it becomes totally switched around. I've got friends who sleep with their eyes wide open. First time I witnessed, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It was like, hello, eyes wide open and no sensory input whatsoever. So eyes open or closed, but in this case, and what I recommend is eyes closed and there's a particular eye mask that I recommend. Pass this around. This is called a mind fold. You can get them off Amazon or eBay for about 15 pounds. You'll notice on the back side, it has two eye cutouts and some soft foam. When you wear one of these masks, if you're in a room lit in this sort of fashion, if it's fitting just snug enough, there will be no leakage of light. You can have your eyes wide open because there's holes for your eyes to go into. You can have your eyes wide open and it'll still be pitch black. It's a really good eye mask. And the reason I suggest using an eye mask with lucid dream and out-of-body practice is this. What if you're lying there and about 30, you've done 30 minutes of intense breath work and then you relax and then you suddenly realize that you can see your ceiling. You might assume your eyes are open, but what if you're actually seeing through your eyelids? because your non-physical sight is tuned in, your clairvoyance is tuned in. If you have an eye mask on, there is no way you're gonna, well, you'll still get tricked, but it's less likely you're going to get tricked. There's been a number of times, even when this mask, suddenly there's like a bright shaft of light that will come in from one direction, and I'm convinced I haven't fit the mask properly and somebody's come in and put on a light. And then I take off the mask and it's pitch black and there's nobody in the room. So it's best to wear an eye mask because sometimes, like I said, you'll get tricked and it's best, it'll be less frequently when you're wearing a mask of that nature, okay? So about 30 minutes of, of breath work. While you're doing the breath work, I'm creating a new audio track uh, for my next nine day um, out of body astral projection retreat, which is next month. Um, I'm very happy once it's produced to send you each a copy. This is the setup that I've got. So for 30 minutes, there's a few things going on at the beginning of the audio track. There's an isochronic tone, which takes you from 10 hertz to 3.86 hertz. You can come in, darling. This is my wife, Sky. if nobody's met her before. Hi. Hi. So the first thing going on in this audio track is an isochronic tone, uh, which is sound technology. So it's taking you from 10 hertz down to 3.86 the range between 3.86 hertz and 4 hertz, which is the border between delta and theta, is prime territory for out-of-body and astral projection. Prime. And it's been studied by the Monroe Institute for decades now. And uh, 3.86 hertz to 4 hertz. 1 hertz is like somebody switching on and off a light switch, one time on, one time off per second. 10 hertz is somebody switching that light off and on, 10 times on, 10 times off per second, all right? So if somebody says, um, I wanna meditate and get into alpha, alpha is between like nine hertz and 13 hertz. Uh, theta is between like four hertz and eight hertz. Delta goes down to about 0.5 hertz and then epsilon. Epsilon is currently the lowest recorded brainwave state. And then you go upwards from alpha into beta, high, high beta, gamma, hyper gamma, all the way up to lambda. Lambda is 200 hertz and above. When you get up to lambda, you can have a very slow epsilon wave riding on those very fast lambda waves. When you get down to the very slow epsilon waves, you can have a very fast lambda wave riding on those very slow epsilon waves. So it's like a full circle of consciousness, okay? So at the very beginning of this track, while you're doing the breath work for 30 minutes is an isochronic tone that is slowly ramping you down to the perfect state, brainwave state, which will also be on the track tomorrow. The next thing I've got on this audio track to really help me out and stay focused is a heartbeat, a simulation of a heartbeat. Really soft, but it starts off at about 60 beats and it goes down to 40 beats because it will literally, your body will start to match it. It's a really powerful effect. The more relaxed you get, the better. The next thing I've got going on is the sound of ocean waves. 
real ocean waves that have been recorded with really good recording equipment. Um, it's all that you're going to hear. And basically, this is the visualization I want you to have for 30 minutes while you're doing the breath work. You're lying down like on the, sh the shoreline of a beach. And when you hear the ocean surf, uh, that's when I finish this track. But what you can do when you're doing the breath work, I want you to realize you're doing energy work. Are you not? That's what breath work is. So when you're breathing in, the breath, the conscious breath, literally becomes the physical manifestation of prana, which is non-physical energy. And you're taking in earth energy and you're storing it here in this energy center here. And then you can move that energy up and down the body for different purposes. So imagine yourself for 30 minutes breathing in. And while you're breathing in, you can use a visualization to help you do energy work. So imagine yourself lying on the shoreline. You don't have to be able to visualize very well. You can just perceive yourself lying on a shoreline. And with or without audio, you can hallucinate a sound. Hallucinate the sound of the ocean surf literally coming up to the shoreline, coming up from your feet, up your legs, and it's very quite shallow, up to your chest, and then you know the water line is maybe to around here on your neck and your ears, yeah? And you can just imagine literally every time it washes up onto the shoreline and through you, that is literally a wave of consciousness, of pure light, coming in through the feet, right up into the body. And then on exit, it's taken all the stale energy, everything else away. Yeah? Every single cycle. So you're doing this breath work. Every few cycles, you're just imagining by hallucinating the sound. Or when you get the audio track, it'll do it for you. And literally for 30 minutes, can you imagine 30 minutes of deep, intense breath work, 30 minutes of visualizing slash pretending slash perceiving this ocean surf, which is a metaphor for pure light, the ocean of consciousness, just coming up through your feet, sweeping up through you, literally doing energy work. You're, the wave is like metaphor for moving energy up the body, up the spine. You know, the cerebral um, uh, fluid up the spine, this powerful sort of awakening experience. So it's a really powerful metaphor. It's what I would do for 30 minutes while I'm doing the breath work, something of that level. Because all thought creates on some level reality. If you're perceiving these ocean waves and this light, what you're basically doing is you're creating this energy matrix for astral projection. And the more that you do it, it reinforces it more and more. And you're literally enlivening your energy body, which uh, can produce what's called the etheric duplicate, as well as you energizing your astral form. A lot of times when people have their first OBEs, they complain of not being able to see very clearly um, or not at all. They can feel that they're, they're, they're in their body and their energy body limbs are floating around, but they can't see very clearly. They've not used their energy body for a lifetime in a conscious way to see through with clairvoyance, through the eyes of that energy form. How can that possibly be any different from you learning to walk for the first time? When, somebody, when you were crawling as a baby, you went from totally immobile to then getting to a point of being able to turn over one side to the next, to be able to then pull yourself along, to then crawling around and then holding yourself up and then starting to walk. Using your energy body, your etheric body, and your astral body is no different. For a lifetime, they've been neglected, those muscles. Those energy muscles have been neglected. So it's learning just like when we pulled ourselves up as children for the first time as a toddler. We did not have full brain muscle control. We must now learn mind energy body control. Does that make sense? For a lifetime, nobody's informed you how to practice this. So for the first 30 minutes, I'm doing the, the breath work, I'm doing visualization, and I'm doing energy work. And I'm building this matrix, which is perfect for astral projection. I'm building this sense of light within my energy body, and my, my astral body. Everybody with me so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're breathing and visualizing at the same time? Exactly. I'm visualizing these waves just coming in. And those waves are, like I said, a metaphor for pure white light.
Okay. No, because what you're going to do next, you're not just going to be breathing and visualizing, you're going to be using a mantra. Okay, put your notepads down, sit forward. <laughs> okay, here we go. Breathe through the nose. Like the Laughing Buddha, you're expanding your abdominal muscles. So expanding the abdomen, so breathing in, bringing that energy, that air right down to the base of the lungs. Expa extending, expanding it, extending it, <laughs> expanding it for two seconds. Out breath, collapsing, out through the nose or out through the mouth, your choice. Keep repeating the pattern, so two seconds in, one second out, or one second in, one second out, whatever you're comfortable with. Keep breathing as I talk. Very deep, intense breath work. I actually want to hear your breath. Keep breathing as you hear the sound of my voice. Now I want you to start to use a mantra. The mantra is this. I am light. I am light. Keep the breathing and continue with the mantra. No break in the mantra. No gap. I am light. I am light. Keep breathing. I am light. I am light. Get lost in it. Completely lost in it. I am light. I am light. Now the ocean surf. It comes. The first wave washes up along the surf, right up your body from your feet to your neck and then back down again. For 30 minutes, that's what you're doing. You're getting high. You're going to get very high by the end of 30 minutes. If you get to the point where you feel like you're about to pass out, scale down the breathing. Okay? We don't... <laughs> you're lying down and you're sitting down. It's not going to cause a big issue, but you know, some people literally get lightheaded more than others. It's, it could be a sign of many things, but it's, it's taking baby steps. Okay? Also, does it matter if you do it in through the nose and do it out through the mouth, or can you do it in through the nose? And do I'm it happy to, for you to do whether it is ever comfortable as long as you're breathing in through the nose. Okay? okay? Now, it is almost, almost, almost impossible to get to 30 minutes and be asleep if you're especially if you change the mantra to this i am i am i am white light i am i am i am white light because now you're counting you're not just doing a mantra you're keeping track with working memory of the counts three count one count light i am i am i am white light i am i am i am white light it is challenging to fall asleep under those circumstances but it is with presence that must, you must have presence there for this practice. But if you're doing this for 30 minutes, you are literally, like I said, you are building this matrix, these perfect conditions for lucid dreaming and astral projection. Um, and do you recommend us not making sound while breathing? Because we're all. Sorry. Breathing. Do you recommend not making any sound? No, I want you to make... Oh, as in the mantra or the breath? No, the breath. Oh, yeah, I want it to be audible. I want you to... I mean, if you want to... If you're not used to sort of being more audible, it's not a problem. As long as you're doing deep breath work. It doesn't have to be very audible, all right? But I think sometimes people are a little bit shy about it. If there's nobody around, you can be as audible as you want, Okay but it's up to you. But one to two seconds in and then one second out or two seconds in it. Either make it an even practice, one to one ratio or two to one ratio as in two seconds in, one second out. Doing that mantra, especially more complex, I am, I am, I am white light or I am, I am, I am light. And you're repeating that for 30 minutes while hallucinating the sounds of ocean waves, while hallucinating the, you know, the light, which is energy work. Every thought creates on some level of reality. On the next dimensions, thought forms get created with literally every single thought that we have. And then feelings drive those thought forms. So let's say, for example, you have somebody who's very clairvoyant sitting with you. They can literally see your thoughts in the form of, in form around your body, around your head. Okay? So... It's getting used to the idea that as you're creating this idea 
this metaphor of this ocean wave, which is light, you are drawing light to you from abundant sources around you. Doesn't mean you're leeching it from people around you. Abundant sources, I said. Okay? So you can mix up the, the thought process. You can have, while you're doing the mantra, you can set the intent at the beginning to call in guides and have guides directing energy into your body. All right? You can ask very loving, very involved, advanced beings from most spiritual traditions to literally sit with you and direct the energy of light from whatever level of reality they're on because they are not the ones in crisis. We are, in the sense of the fear that I'm not getting help, the fear that nobody's there. The universe is very thought responsive, very thought responsive. You think that will be transmitted faster than the speed of light. And whoever you're directing it towards will receive it. So get used to the idea of asking for help. So at the beginning of the session, set the intent to have guides and protectors, whatever you want to come to you and direct the energy of light into your body for the purpose of astral projection, for the purpose of lucid dreaming. Set the intent at the very beginning that that parallel version of you that has already mastered astral projection will download the tools into you, will download the instincts into your consciousness. If you do not ask, you will not get. It's pretty simple. So ask, <laughs> set the intent, and then have intentionality during the actual session. Remember, intent is motive. My motive is to love you. But I have to be proactive in actually showing you that love. Does that make sense? On that mantra, just a minute. So if you, if you imagine a, an avatar, for example, a Jesus or something. Uh-huh, right? right, yeah. And then you go, Jesus, Jesus, and you then combine it with I am white light, or fill me with white light, then you'll Beautiful. Be or deeper energy. Beautiful. Okay. Absolutely stunning. All right? Whatever I teach you, within minutes, within weeks at the most, days at the most, but within minutes, I want you already transforming it into your own making it your own because we're all different we all feel loved in different ways this is why there's the, there's a book called the five love languages <coughs> fantastic book because we don't all feel loved in the same way like i've got this really good friend every time he comes to uh, he lives in france every time he comes for a visit he brings me a gift and this time because i figured it out that that was how he feels loved is when he receives gifts so i got him a gift and after he gave me the gifts and he expected, you know, he was just giving because he wants to show me love. I said, I have a gift for you. And he, you should have seen how much he lit up. He was like, you have a gift for me? And I gave him the gift and he was like, this is for me? And I was like, it's for you. Because that's how he's used to feeling love through receiving gifts or giving gifts. But sometimes you come across people who that's not their primary love language. For some people, it's quality time. When you spend quality time with them, they light up. When you're completely present with them, they're on fire. For some people, it's words of affirmation. That was me as a child. I've kind of changed a little bit now, but as a child, whenever my dad in particular said, you did a good job, son, man, I felt like 10 times bigger. We all feel differently with this stuff, so make these mantras your own. All right, that was beautiful. Does that make sense? On the breath, I wanted to ask, um, the more, the faster you breathe, the better or not? In terms of effect and the brain strength, so it differs for everyone. It really depends on the, the breathwork tradition and what is trying to be achieved. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many different you know, breathwork practices. I would go online and I would study various forms. Like, for example, the Wim Hof method. The Wim Hof method is all about... Um, the, the nervous system. It's all about the immune system and firing up the immune system. Other breathwork practices are about moving energy around for a particular purpose, like building a, a, a ball of chi, you know, for one reason or another, okay? Or maybe projecting energy to other people, not even keeping it within me in the sense of I build the an abundant energy within me and then I deliver it and I've got a constant source replenishing me as I'm giving it because I know I must receive in order to give. I must receive to give. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other words, you get to a deficit to where you're literally 
giving, not receiving, or taking, and not receiving. There, it can get really a messed up dynamic. The dynamic is a natural giving to receive and receiving, receiving to give. Whatever state you're in, you start where you're at. I'm happier to give at this moment, but I know in giving I will receive in some form or the opposite, okay? So breathwork practices have different, different intent. For the intent of astral projection, I would suggest following my guidance as in drawing the breath in, realizing you're not just drawing in air, you're also drawing in non-physical energy such as prana. There's different names for it. Uh, or, Oregon. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Whatever you're doing though for 30 minutes, I want you building energy. And you're setting the intent that this energy is having a profound effect on my etheric body and my astral form. I want you to imagine you're like a Russian doll. Your physical body is surrounded by an, the human energy field, which is the leading edge of your etheric body. And then outside of that, you could, and this is just as a visual aid, the Russian doll idea, because ultimately you're not one inside the next. It's more like all of these different energy parts of you are occupying exactly the same space, just vibrating at a different rate. Does that make sense? So ultimately, when you have an out-of-body experience, nothing is coming out of your physical body because there's nothing in your physical body in that sense. Your etheric body is literally on the same spatial plane as the physical body. And this is why when we suddenly have that sense of lifting up away from the body, it feels like something's coming out. It's just something's come out of alignment with the physical body. This is therefore why you never need worry about something possessing you when you go on an astral adventure because you're not leaving the vessel empty. Things can attach to you. Things can attach cords to you. Okay, this is how it works. Things can start to get to a point when you become very imbalanced, can start to uh, really work through you energetically, you know, sort of mentally, etc. But this is a really imbalanced state. It would have to be really, really seriously you out of balance for these, these kind of things to happen, like what we would call something like possession. And even possession is literally that there is just enough of an access point for another being to start to animate that physical body. But this is a rare occurrence for most people. This is not the norm, okay? And like your guides, people come to me and say, okay, um, I don't know if I have guides. How do I attract guides? We all have helpers. We all have beings looking after us. But you always have an opportunity to work with different levels of guides. You can call in new guides. Let's say, for example, you start like with your theta healing. Wouldn't you want to work with guides who have already mastered this stuff? So you call them in. You ask your existing guides. In most cases, they're not ha going to have these moments of like, you know, feeling, oh, my heart, oh, they want a different guide. Oh, I'm not good enough. <laughs> That's not what's happening with your advanced high-level guides. Your advanced high-level guides are, oh, my God, she's learning to ask for more. She's really getting how abundant this universe is. Let's organize her to have another guide dedicated specifically to this. Okay, is this making sense? Yeah. It is about abundance. It is learning that when you become abundant, you become a conduit for being able to create more spiritual wealth for everybody around you. This space, these gongs, all this equipment right here costs about 50,000 pounds. I will never recoup my investment as such by running sessions one, one person at a time in here. I just won't. But I make enough money by selling the light machine to where I can find ways to give back. I'm creating enough spiritual wealth to where I can give I can go to events, like maybe somebody calls me from the provinces, a small little um, social, uh, you know, sort of club. And they're like, can you come and speak on the topic of lucid dreaming? Um, we can only afford to pay you your train fare and maybe some other small travel expense. I'm like, it's absolutely fine. I'm not turning down the opportunity to make any money whatsoever, but I'm abundant to a level to where I'm already valuing myself. Look around me. Does it look like I don't value myself? I do. 
I've gotten to this point because I understand how energy works. I know that when I give, I am receiving. It may not be in the exact form I'm giving, but I will receive. Especially when I'm in that mindset of my default mode literally becomes gratitude. Every time something good happens in my life, I say thank you and then I follow it up with more please. More please because whatever that experience was, I want more of it. Even if it's me giving 10 pounds to a homeless person, if I say more please, I'm saying more opportunities to assist people in need. That doesn't mean every per homeless person I see, I'm gonna give a tenner. It when I'm called to do something, I will show up is what I'm saying. More please, call me more. Call me more to, to show up. I will show up. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? This is the astral projection practice. This is only part of it so far. We're gonna finish this off so we can get on to some things like the light machine. This is the first 30 minutes and this is how deep it must be. By the end of 30 minutes, you're probably gonna feel vibrations and tingling throughout your entire body because you first of all, completely enriched your blood with oxygen. That alone will make you feel different. But you've also been working with energy, with those metaphors of the waves, calling in beings like Jesus, who are now directing light to you. They're creating literally this matrix within you, which are conditions for astral projection. Your intention that I'm literally energizing my, my etheric body. I'm energizing my astral body. That's what's happening in those 30 minutes. Okay, so after that, you're going to remain completely still, especially after the breath work, no movement. If you have to itch, itch. But otherwise, completely still. One of the next things that you could do, which uh, is quite beautiful because it sticks with the, line, the idea of the ocean of consciousness. With each wave coming more and more towards the end of the 30 minute mark, you can imagine yourself, the waves have started to carry you out a little bit into the shallows. And you're perfectly safe. All of the creatures in your intentional sea are friendly. Even the sharks, even the stingrays, everybody, even the jellyfish, they're all friendly. If one of them were to touch you, it was for the purpose of adding more light. Everything becomes friendly because it's your universe. It's your hallucination, your visualization, all right? It's carried you out into the shallows, but it's carrying out your energy body. It has no lungs. You don't have to worry about drowning. As you're getting nearer to the end of that 30 minutes, I want you to imagine yourself starting to just sink down into the water, the waters of consciousness. Can you now imagine some air bubbles? kind of going up around you and the beams of rays of light of the sun coming down to the water scattering down into the water can you just imagine that scenery that maybe crystal clear water all around you and you're just completely buoyant at this point you're not going up nor down you're just completely buoyant you're feeling weightless and then you start some energy body practice. You know how I said you had to learn to get used to walking, you know, like you did as a baby? Now we want to get that mind, energy body, command and control. How can we do it? We're now totally buoyant in the sea of consciousness, not going up or down at that point. I want you to now put your notepads down and I want you to try something else for me. Put your hands on your lap like this. For about 10 seconds, just wiggle your fingers like this. Now stop. Imagine them wiggling. Don't move them. Just imagine them wiggling. As physically, realistically as you can, imagine them moving to that same effect. Can you feel a little bit? Look at me. This is what you're asking your energy body hands to do at the moment. In reality, because you haven't used them for a lifetime, they're probably doing this. <laughs> Maybe doing this. <laughs> for a lifetime, we've not consciously used them in that manner. 
So just like your wobbly little legs when you're standing up as a child, you don't have full command and control. So what I want you to do now, you've done 30 minutes of beautiful energy work. You've imagined those waves taking you out and you're just sinking down in the water. It's your energy body. No need of drowning. You get down into the shallows. The, the shafts of sunlight are coming down. It's beautiful blue water. And you're buoyant. You're not moving up or down. I now want you to imagine moving your energy body arms like this. You're now swimming underwater, correct? Maybe you're dolphin kicking your legs. If you're imagining this, you're actually commanding your energy body to make these movements. You do this practice for weeks on end. Maybe this segment, maybe about 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes just imagining going from being buoyant to sort of swimming underwater to ascending. So pushing yourself upwards. Descending, just allowing yourself again descending being buoyant perfectly still maybe just allowing one energy body arm just to sort of drift like this the other one to drift and imagine rubbing them together while in this state imagine an energy body leg while you're buoyant just drifting energy body arms just drifting and you're just buoyant you're just being held and you're just allowing these limbs to drift. Imagine doing that for about 10 or 15 minutes. By the time you finish the 30 minutes that led into that, your mind is no longer cluttered or you are no longer thinking about anything else. And 95% of the time, your mind is clear. Even if you wanted to think about something, it would be difficult. Your work in memory is focused on one thing now that has a profound effect on the energy body because there are no longer all of these, this noise to signal ratio where the noise, the signal's lost in the noise like a needle in a haystack. You're now to the point to where the, the haystack is, is gone and the needle is shining in the sun, glistening in the sun. All those other shards of hay were just noise. They're all gone. Can you imagine the intent on the energy body now? Because you're not... Your focus is not fragmented. I want to move my energy body, but I'm aware of my tinnitus or I'm aware of that I have to swallow or whatever else or the sounds ticking clock or whatever else. When you're in that deep and you're now focused like a laser, isn't that just like really condensed light? You're focused like a laser. And you're, your focus is now intentional, very intentional to move my energy body through hallucinating this the scenery, or just perceiving this movement. Don't even have to visualize it. You can just perceive this movement. Perceive the rays of light still coming down, still f energizing you, coming down through the water. It's so peaceful under the water. But this isn't just water. This is the ocean of consciousness. Is this all making sense? Yeah. I'm trying to help you get to a point where this is effortless stuff. Let's now say you take your foot off the gas, you allow yourself to do what's called clicking out, where literally you fall asleep. And then you come back into awareness. You click back in. Usually when you've done that much energy work, you won't stay for sleep very long, especially if it's not a practice before bed, but it's a practice, you know, after you've had some good sleep. You're literally, you'll click in and out. And every time you click back in, you remain perfectly still First thing you do is maybe you, you, you try to make an exit. You could do something like, well, first you would, you would figure out, do I feel anything? Is it like powerful energy surge all of a sudden? Do you feel yourself rising away from your body? Perfect, you just go with the flow. If you can actually suddenly wake up, click back in and you feel a limb actually floating over here and you know your arm is here, but you feel this over here. You've literally become aware of your energy body. And your arm is not having an out-of-body experience. It's just no longer aligned with your physical arm. It's, it's literally your energy body has become loose. Loose to the point where you could make a strong exit intent. What could you do? You could pick a target. You could literally pick something like somewhere you know intimately. For me, if I'm in that box, 
the places I know intimately, and this is just my own, I'm standing on top of that island in the kitchen. I literally project my awareness all there. I'm looking down at all the surfaces from this height, this greater height, and I say something like, I'm here with all of my essence. And along, a lot of times I'll feel this energy surge and I'm somewhere, but I'm no longer in my body. It can be as simple as that. Let's say that doesn't go to plan, no, out, no exit, you click out again. Then you click back in. Keep your physical body still. Do not move. Keep your eyes closed. Do not open them. Suddenly you can see through your eye mask. Whatever you see, you say, mm, take me there. And then you might feel some, some movement and then you're somewhere. You're no longer in your body. Or your awareness has shifted into a dream, a lucid dream, or a conscious out-of-body state. Let's say nothing happens. You click out again. You click back in. If that alarm for three hours has not gone off, you do not move. What I say next is probably the most vital thing you're going to hear me say for the out-of-body practice. You do not move. <laughs> and I mean that. You do not move. You do not move until either the alarm goes off or you have an out-of-body experience. But you do not move. You can click out and click, click out and click back in all you want. But every time you click back in, working memory comes back on board. I should be doing something. I should be visualizing something. I should be checking to see if my eyes are closed and I can see through my eye mask. I should be feeling for energy. I should be projecting my awareness somewhere. I can get back into that ocean of consciousness and just be buoyant and do my energy body practice while having the intent to move out of body at any convenient moments. But this is the practice for three hours. There are no excuses. Literally, you're still for three hours and you're practicing for three hours. Clicking in and out of consciousness is normal and acceptable and should happen. Therefore, you never need to get upset at yourself for falling unconscious because you will come back. And when you come back, as long as you've stayed still, as long as you keep your eyes closed, one of my favorite things to do after I click back in is to do maybe about two or three minutes of very light breath work. It'll feel weird because your whole body will be almost like in a state of paralysis, if not in paralysis. And all you will feel will be your respiratory system. That's all you're going to feel. And just literally the rising and collapsing of that system, of just feel, feel, feeling that system filling with air and then expelling it. That's all you'll feel. And you, and you won't have to think about, oh, but I'm going to break the state. You really won't. Please trust me. I've done this for years. Please trust me. You will not break your state. You'll do the breath for about two or three minutes, and then you can start to visualize. And after you've clicked out and clicked back in a few times, visualization will become more easy. And you can visualize yourself straight into a dream. You can literally incubate a dream. You can think about scenery. Think about a dream you had earlier in the night. Think about a dream you recorded the night before, the week before. Completely immerse yourself in that dream. Command yourself to wake up on cue certain things, like if suddenly a deceased relative came into the dream. Maybe when you woke up and you recorded, you're like, why didn't I wake up? Why didn't I realize that was a deceased relative? Because your logical reasoning was tuned out and you had no control, you know, no access of working memory. Now, every time you wake up, intentional, you're working memory, what am I to be doing? Okay, I let me pull this out of my short-term memory, I want to practice this, or my long-term memory, I want to pr practice this. I'm going to get busy and be very intentional, very proactive. I'm going to do stuff. One of my favorites now, like I said, is just in that sea of consciousness, because I can just have that idea of being buoyant, not moving up or down, but I can just let my energy body limbs just drift without moving physical body. And usually when I click out and click back in, my energy body limbs are like doing this. And I'm almost like in a state of paralysis, if not in a state of paralysis. And I can feel those limbs. And when I feel them, you know what I do? I gain control. I grab the first thing I can grab and I wench myself out of my body. Or I roll out. Or I literally start getting a rocking motion going and then I flip myself out like I'm doing a somersault. I promise you, let yourself click out and back in a few times. Because you're going to click back in one of these times within three hours and you're going to be in the perfect state and you're just going to be able to glide right out of your body. Um, when you're saying, you know, what does it mean? Falling 
conscious. Going to sleep. Falling asleep. You're losing awareness. You're falling asleep. And then literally you're waking up again. Yeah, we're literally just calling it, clicking in and clicking out. So you're falling unconscious and then you're becoming conscious again. So you're falling asleep and waking up again. But every time you wake up, you remain perfectly still. You don't even open your, eye, your eyelids. Because I promise you, for three hours, as long as you haven't achieved insomnia, which can happen on those occasions where you just feel that energy of insomnia and it just becomes annoying. If you literally can get into the state where, because you've had six hours of sleep, and now you're going up to nine hours with this practice because you're, your body's getting rest. You're going down into, you know, theta waves. You're, you're you know, going into that, that state, which is the perfect state for dream-induced sleep. Okay, does this make sense? If you practice like this, three, four nights a week, so you basically say, okay, I'm going to take a few nights off, and then I'm going to practice a few nights. So if maybe you practice once every two to three nights in the beginning, I promise you within a week to two weeks, you will crack it. And once you crack it the first time, you'll be hooked. You will not want to close that door again. <laughs>